What do we mean by soundness in pedigree dogs? I first set out the key components of soundness for the judging diploma course, which I wrote with a great deal of advice from Les Crawley, Pamela Cross Stern, Peter Larkin and Wendy Bora back in 1980. Not that the concept was new, but I think my phraseology summarising those ideas was concise and has stood the test of time. It is that, in any species subject to selective breeding, any departure in conformation or characteristics from the norm is acceptable so long as the animal can eat, move, breathe, mate and whelp and suckle, so far as females are concerned, naturally and effectively. Once you have to restrict exercise, mash food, treat eyes on a regular basis, have generalised and persistent back or joint problems, to give just a few examples, then the exaggeration selectively bred for has exceeded what is tolerable. Wendy Bora used to use the example of a breed of pigeon, which had such a distorted beak that it could no longer release its chicks from the egg. And I know a few years ago, a food company produced a specially shaped kibble, which allowed very short-faced cats to pick it up easily. This is not a criticism of the food company. They were only responding to customer demand after all. But it is a criticism of the breeders who felt that such short-faced cats were acceptable. Now apply the same arguments to dogs and you can see where I am coming from. I think none of these criteria need any further explanation, but in recent years I have come to the conclusion that we should add a further requirement, that a healthy dog will have a length of life within the longevity span of the bell curve for the species as a whole. Uh, for those who, like me, have forgotten all that stuff about graphs and statistics they learned at school, uh, perhaps I should explain. A bell curve is a graph which looks, just as it says, roughly the shape of the sort of bell used in church, church steeples or in a handbell. The graph expresses two factors being measured. They can be anything, but in this instance it is age, which is measured along the x-axis, showing the length of life in years, and the number that die, shown on the height of the y-axis at any given time. In statistics, it is usual for the very first and the very last readings to be omitted, so this would eliminate stillborn puppies and those dying within a few days of birth and the exceptionally old. What is left in this instance is an indication of the population longevity of a given species. At the beginning of the curve, few die young, and at the end, few become very old, so the height of the curve is low at the beginning and tails off right at the end when all the animals are dead. The high point is where the maximum numbers of animals die. There are what are called normal curves for, say, intelligence or height, and these look very much the correct bell shape, but those showing longevity are distorted, for the highest point will be well over halfway along the x-axis. In humans, that highest point is gradually moving further along, as in most populations at least, people stay healthier, so more of us die at an older age. In dogs the same applies. The curve rises until between 9 and 12 it is at its highest and then drops away again as by say 14 years most dogs have died and fewer and fewer live longer lives. If we draw a graph showing the longevity of breeds we have a very different story. Those closest to the norm would fit neatly on the curve for dogs as a whole. But for some, the rise and fall of the line would start earlier and fall away sooner. What we would see is the curve for breeds much larger than the norm, although approximately the same shape, being shifted markedly to the left towards a shorter lifespan. I have not carried out any research into the specific breeds listed in the Kennel Club's uh, 15 highlighted breeds about which they have expressed particular concerns, but I suspect that they too, whatever their size, show that shift to the left described above. If breeders in those breeds can show that this is not the case, please contact me direct at mail at davidcavill.co.uk so that I can bring it to your attention. 
However, extremes of type which affect general health and welfare, which are the result of breeders choosing certain characteristics, are not the same as those affecting genetic health, and many people make the mistake of confusing one with the other. Although there are some generalized genetic conditions which are the result of extreme characteristics. Entropion is one example, and the breathing difficulties which some breeds exhibit is another. However, these are not the same as, say, progressive retinal atrophy, mitral valve disease, or hip dysplasia, which develop unseen. These and many other conditions may certainly be the result of selective breeding, but they are involuntary on the part of the breeder, and for a wide variety of reasons, much more difficult to eradicate. However, with understanding, knowledge and commitment, they can be reduced and eventually eliminated. This may require considerable investment in research, expense on the part of the breeder to run the various tests, and the involvement of other allied breeds, but it can be done. Conditions directly and voluntarily caused by selective breeding, such as entropion, are much easier to deal with, and this is why the Kennel Club is forcing changes in the standards. Chows have successfully greatly reduced entropion simply by focusing on breeding dogs with larger, less deeply set and therefore healthier eyes. Breeding for a longer muzzle can eliminate breeding difficulties. If the dog's mouth cavity has enough room for its tongue and its nasal cavity enough room for airflow, there is no need for it to snuffle. The difference does not need to be great. Shih Tzu have relatively short muzzles but I have come across very few with breeding, breathing problems. As far as longevity is concerned, breeders can increase it simply by breeding smaller or less extreme dogs. None of this is rocket science once one's head has been raised from the sand.